Washington, D.C. experienced a mild snowfall last week. Luckily, City Councilman Trayon White was on it. He knows why it happened. Watch this. It just started snowing out of nowhere this morning, man. Y'all better pay attention to this climate control, man. This climate manipulation. And D.C. keep talking about we're a resilient city. And that's a model based off the Rothschilds controlling the climate to create natural disasters. They can pay for it and own the cities, man. Be careful. Yep, the Rothschilds control the climate. The Rothschilds, of course, are a wealthy Jewish banking clan. They're included in a great many conspiracy theories, but those theories rarely give them credit for the weather. That's an ambitious new twist. Mark Stein is an author and columnist and a part-time meteorologist, and he joins us tonight. What do you make it? So this is, by the way, I live here, so you can laugh all you want, but that's actually mm -hmm. my city councilman speaking there. The Rothschilds control the weather. Did you know that? Uh, well, uh, I did actually, uh, uh, Tucker. They've, uh, they, they bought the weather uh, from God uh, back in <laughs> 1929 uh, when he had a bit of a liquidity problem after the uh, Wall Street crash. And uh, they keep it in the uh, wine cellars at the Chateau Mouton Rothschild estate in France. And uh, they're able to micro-target the climate. Um, for example, it was light snow in your part of Washington, uh, but I gather in the stairwell of Trayon White's uh, apartment building, he actually had an avalanche <laughs> just on his floor. That's, that's how uh, micro-targeted the big Jew weather machine um, is able to be. And, he may, and by the way, you may... You may think it's a light snowfall, but if you actually examine it, it's actually small pieces of gefilte fish, uh, which is why it doesn't melt. And that's why the Jews control the snowplow business. Uh, so they scoop all the gefilte fish in Washington away and they use it to make Louis Farrakhan Calypso albums, uh, which they put out to discredit uh, Louis Farrakhan from telling the truth about the synagogue of Satan. It all makes sense. <laughs> See, the funny thing is, I mean, I don't know if it's funny, it's actually so appalling and shocking that it's, it's hard to, I'm just going to laugh about it. That was, that was, you made me feel better about a city out of control. So then I want to run this by you. Maybe, maybe you can make me feel better about this, too. There's a new uproar on social media over microaggressions at UC Santa Cruz. The school has assembled a list of microaggressions. It warns that phrases like, America is the land of opportunity, and I believe the most qualified person should get the job, are offensive and verboten. The weirdest thing, though, the scariest thing, this list has been in use for years, and there's no sign it's going away. Uh, do you abide by this list, Mark? I thought it was an interesting list. Um, uh, it's interesting they ban the expression, America is a land of opportunity, because yeah. uh, America is a land of opportunity. Let's say you're a person with uh, no talents, <laughs> uh, but a degree of hucksterism, uh, who's figured out that you could uh, get a job, a tenured job as the assistant dean of microaggressions, uh, and, and, and put teenagers, uh, saddle them with six figures of debt, uh, for attempting to criminalize basic social interactions uh, by, by holding big lectures on microaggressions. Now, now, America is such a land of opportunity, you can clean up big time if you do that. If you try to do that in, say, uh, Sudan, uh, no one will come to your lecture on microaggressions because in Sudan they think you were an obvious uh, huckster and the only people who'd be at your lecture would be a camel who came in to get out of the rain and uh, some guy and his <laughs> His child bride who'd actually taken a wrong turn uh, on the way to the uh, female genital mutilation clinic. So only America is such a boundless land of opportunity that becoming an expert, if you become an expert in microaggressions, uh, uh, young people will saddle themselves with a quarter million dollars of debt just to receive your wisdom. Even by your high standards, tonight was an all-time high watermark. Thank you, Mark Stein. You, you made me feel so much better. I can't even stand it. I appreciate it. Thanks, thanks a lot, Tucker. Always a pleasure. See ya. Kind of picture the staffer in question sneering at the middle of the country and maligning an entire group based on their skin color, which I thought was not allowed. Right. Yeah, I don't believe your guest for one second when he thinks, your former guest, when he says he thinks that these, these articles are meant to be satire and make fun of racism. No, 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 no. It, it's exactly, I think, how you painted it, these sort of uh, liberal Oberlin kids who graduated and live in Brooklyn and, and for some reason want to 
uh, believe in this sort of dismantle the wealth narrative, and they think the way to do that is to attack white people. I mean, it's, it's Marxism, it's socialism, and it has the mainstream media's ear. It has mainstream society's ear. Uh, when you see these people who, who obsess over victimhood so much, it's so fascinating because if, if you want to see racism everywhere, if you're brainwashed to see racism everywhere or homophobia everywhere or whatever, then you will. That's the world you will live in. You know, I was having a conversation with, uh, with a woman uh, not too long ago about this, a, a young upper middle class black woman. And she was talking about how badly she you know, gets treated on the street here in New York. And I said to her, what if you lived for one day as a white woman and you were treated the exact same way? People were just as rude to you. What then? Yeah. It uh, doesn't make anybody happier to see everything through that lens. Um, yeah. So let me ask you about something that happened yesterday on The View. I personally missed it, but I've seen the tape. Maybe you saw co-host Joy Behar react to the ongoing protests we've been seeing in Iran by saying the U.S. is on the very brink of executing gay people in the streets. Watch this. It's not apples and apples. It's not equal. Mm -hmm. But we're on a very slippery slope, slope in this country toward throwing democracy out the window well, every the single is, day. We have to defend the freedom of the press and civil rights here. Mm -hmm. We do, but and, we're not being you know, stoned it's, in it's the street a, for being gay. Not yet. Not yet. They're completely... not yet. Now, how close do you think we are to a country where people are stoned in the streets for being gay, as Joy Behar suggests. Look, you know, I have to tell people this all the time. We can't even get funding for the wall, so the gay death camps are definitely not happening till the second term. I mean, we really have some time to battle this. She's, she's completely ridiculous. This narrative that they want to push is so absurd. There's no proof to it. It's total, it's just it's such a load of bull. Uh, I don't know, in, the, in that same discussion, she was uh, sort of ironically saying that the, that the protesters in Iran and uh, the, the so-called women's marchers here, these resist uh, protesters, she called them protesters, uh, are, are basically fighting for the same thing. And she said, well, you know, the, the, the details are different about uh, what, what they're, they're fighting against. Uh, but the, uh, the general thing, that they want democracy and freedom, and ours is deeply under attack in this country. All right, well, firstly, let's talk about that. In Iran, you have women tearing off their headscarves and in their hijabs. And here in New York and in Washington, you have women and men, liberal men, putting them on as a symbol of liberation. Of course. Uh, and when she says, it, yeah, it, it, it's so funny to see her saying our democracy is under attack. But it's First also, I mean, it's such a grotesque overstatement. And I know what it's like to get mad on television, but part of your brain says, you know, pull back a little bit. You know, don't say more than you mean. Don't overstate things grotesquely, because if you do, you're going to be called on it. And you shouldn't say things that aren't true. No one ever calls anybody on the left when they say like, ludicrous things like gays are about to be stoned in the streets. What? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It, it, it's, it's just this hysteria, and they, they have no evidence for it. They have absolutely no evidence for it, and uh, it's, it's exactly, they're just showing who they are. They have no argument. Yeah, uh, it's you childish. Know, yeah, it's very childish. Chadwick Moore, great to see you. All right, thank you, Tucker. Thanks. Well, Berkeley. CNN's Don Lemon suggested that Antifa is a fever dream invented by us. Watch. His obsession with Antifa, I don't, I don't understand. He has an unhealthy obsession with Antifa, and maybe it's because Fox News. I watch Fox News, and, uh, and I've been watching Fox News for years, but lately they are obsessed with Antifa and with yeah. stories about race and pitting. Is, is the president being, then being manipulated by Fox News on these stories? Old Don Lemon. Love Don Lemon. But he's not alone, by the way. Whoopi Goldberg of The View says Antifa isn't merely overblown. It's an outright fabrication. Watch. Antifa is one of those things that, I don't want to say the right, but somebody came up with as a, as a catchphrase so that you could say, you know, oh, there is violence on the other side. But I don't remember violent uh, demonstrations before the gentleman who's in now got in. But oftentimes I've found that sometimes the side that is crutching the loudest mm -hmm. has sort of orchestrated this so they can bitch about it. Who watches that show? Well, to help us sort out what is real and what is fake, what's a Potemkin protest group? We're joined by townhall.com senior columnist Kurt Schlichter. Kurt, is it possible, and I've actually heard people suggest this, some elected officials, that Antifa Beneath the masks, they're all townhall.com readers. 
Well, yeah, I mean, I, I, I like to mask up and go beat people in the head with a bike lock. Uh, no, really, it's all an illusion, Tucker. You're pulling the strings on the president. You're convincing them that there's not really crowds of uh, little junior anarchists and uh, angry suburban rich kids uh, acting out their fantasies on our streets. No, it's all, it's all an illusion. And look, I, I've had run-ins with Don Lemon in the past. And after listening to what he said, you know, you, you always have to wonder, has Don been drinking again? And after hearing him say that, I'm kind of hoping he has, because that's the only possible explanation for that, that, that string of words that was so transcendently stupid that my head's still spinning. I don't know if I can drive home. So I've always, I can't help myself. I like Don Lemon. I still like Don Lemon, but um, I don't think he's responsible for what he said. But, but there's a conservative radio show host who took a ton of heat for suggesting that one tragedy was, you know, made up, that there were actors involved in it. I hear mainstream media figures basically making the same argument right here, that this is some conspiracy, that these left-wing agitators, violent ones, are actually right-wingers.